And welcome to everybody, a warmest greetings to everyone for day three as we round off the most magic of conferences. One of the most brilliant conferences because it's apart from what we've been seeing where many conferences up to now have just followed the format of having someone talk and everybody listen. But your voice has been really instrumental in bringing together visions and bringing together what will be the a magic white paper. It, this conference seems to get better every day, doesn't it? It seems more dynamic and more interesting as we're unpacking the sorts of things that is going to give you um, as individuals a leading edge over your competitors and enable you to play a bigger game. I want to say personally, your amazing contributions and courage to discuss and bring to the table concerns and challenges has made my job really interesting because I'm loving hearing what's on your mind and hearing some of the things that you want to resolve and, and, and do a lot better. I really feel that we've all learned a lot, not just from the speakers, but from each other. And that generosity of spirit is something that we need to take back to the offices, back to our businesses, and even back to our homes. I know Robin and Antonio are committed to your continual learning post this conference and want to remind you that you've got so many options to continue with self-paced learning and even certification. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on because they want to demonstrate that the value of your membership goes really far beyond the conference and you will be supported and nurtured by a community that understands your world. As your MC, I've loved being part of this conference and because it actually gives me an insight into your world. But Robin and Antonio, you've done the hard yards, you've done the hard work. So I'd like to um, hand over to you to once again um, share some thoughts, ideas, and help help together frame up the the conference uh, over the next two hours. Robin, Antonio, over to you. So thank you, Ricky, and it's our pleasure again to share with you. And to kick off this evening, first of all, we'd like to emphasize, oh, sorry, to kick off today <laughs> for Bun Leong and I in Singapore, it's nighttime. So, uh, and for Ricky, but uh, the focus for today is going to shift a little bit from the previous two days. And what we're going to look at more about today is starting to think about the themes of the future of strategy implementation. And today is very much practitioner day. So we thank uh, Richard, who's joining us from APMG, and also Marvin, who's a senior VP at Singapore Airlines. And they're going to give us really a hands-on experience to blend with the more academic that we've had on the previous two days. But one of the key areas of implementation for the next few years is very much around digitalization. And we thought we'd kick off today with a little bit of a quiz. And this is nine questions about digital, which are either fact or myth. And they start relatively easier and then get a little bit tougher. Um, so here we go. And you can either unmute yourself and shout out the answers or just put them in the chat room, whichever you prefer. So the first question is, adopting digitalization is a technology driven initiative, fact or myth? What do we reckon? Yeah, there we go. Most of, yeah, everyone's got it. An easy one to start with. So it is, in fact, a myth. Okay. As we know today, adopting digitalization requires the whole organization to transform, fueled around the customer and the employees. 
So question two, a digital vision is a necessity to succeed, fact or myth? Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Joe. Yep. Oh, we got one or two. Okay, majority are going for fact, few are going for myth. It is a, a fact. And this is not just Antonio, my research, but um, Harvard Business Review published a paper 18 months ago now. They studied the top 10 successful transformations of the last decade and identified that this was one of the best practices. Question three, not all customers need to become digital customers, fact or myth? Oh, Randy was very fast with the fact, a few myths. Okay, we have a split decision here. It isn't a fact. It's not about converting all your customers to becoming digital. There will still be a segment possibly who want to use the old way, use more traditional. So we focus predominantly on those who are, especially at the beginning, who are early adopters, who are willing to do this. So focus on your customers who are a natural fit. Don't try and force everyone into digital when you're implementing it. Question four of nine, short one. It's a top-down driven initiative, fact or myth? Myth, 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 yeah, everyone's gone myth, okay? The leaders create what needs to happen in digital, but the implementation happens bottom up. What do we mean? You're doing design thinking, hackathons, identifying customer pain points. You're mapping out customer journeys. Leaders don't do this because they don't know the day-to-day -day work. It's the people who are running every day with the customers and the business who are involved in this. So it's very much designed at the top, but implemented ground up. Five of nine. This one's a little bit more tricky. Business leaders are accountable for technology targets. Fact or myth? Okay, most are going fact, a few myths. Thank you, Fari. Thank you, Gurby. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Martin. This is one of the best practices. To be successful in implementation of digital, we need to have that fusion of both the business and the technology. And when they have aligned goals who are responsible for both of them, that's when you really get the business to own the technology and vice versa. Many of us will remember that if just a few years ago, business said, this is what I want to do and passed it to technology and said, make it happen. Those days are gone. Collectively, we now decide on what needs to be done and we're both responsible. Question six and nine, young employees are more acceptable to adopting digitalization. Fact or myth, what do you think? Wow, Martin, very quick. Couple of myths, most are going facts. Thank you, Andre. It is a myth. It's one of the big mistakes. We, we were working with one company and they brought in young people and this was their philosophy and they struggled. In one of the banks I work with, they introduced video call centers and to manage the video call center, they initially put young people, but they then discovered that elder, older people who grew up using Skype are more comfortable doing it. This was prior to, to COVID. So, you know, the fact is that adopting digitalization is age indiscriminate. Seven of nine. Not all reports have to be in real time. Fact or myth? Thank you, Dr. Sadi. Thanks, Sunny. Wow, everyone. Okay, majority, one or two are going myth, but most are going fact. So 
Another error is to try and make all your reports real time, which they don't need to be. It's about converting all your customers, but identifying the, uh, sorry, there's a typo there, sorry. So in the reports, it's about finding which are most critical and focusing on the ones you need, but not everything has to be in real time. Number eight, from digitalization, revenue savings are greater than revenue generated. This one will take a second. Okay, well done, Erwin, Sunny, well done, Harid, Michelle, yep, Bun Leong, well done. It is in fact a myth. What we are seeing now is we are becoming companies are becoming more mature on their digital journeys. Is yes, initially the cost savings are there as you put in RPA, robotic process automation, or you start using AI and machine learning, but. As you lock in your digital customers, the revenue of new business, the top line grows greater than the bottom line. And the final question as a warm up for today, the older the organization, the less profit per employee generated. Fact or myth? Gerpi, very fast on myth. Martin, thank you. Randy, yep. Yeah. Everyone's got it, yeah. Okay. so. It's a fact, okay? The older the organization struggle to overcome legacy systems and cultures that act as a barrier to adoption of digital. Younger organizations, in contrast, require fewer and fewer employees, more automated and less labor intensive. So that's a little bit warm up of one of the areas that Antonio and I think will be in the future of strategy implementation. Okay. Antonio, do you want to introduce the course? I'll take you through. Yeah, please just walk. Just a quick reminder on the course. So you can find, I think many of you are already members of, of the Institute and you've uh, go through the course, many are already certified. Uh, so just a small reminder more for those who are uh, new participants and, and new to the Institute. Um, well, you can scan this and it will take you to our site uh, where you can find all the information. Next. Well, the whole foundation of the course is based on the strategy implementation roadmap. It's not descriptive, if not the intention to be uh, something that you just use once or is something that we believe is, is something that is cyclical. You can be in different phases in your organization and and that's where we develop this strategy implementation roadmap with seven pillars or dimensions. And that's the essential, or that's the course. Every, every pillar has different modules, which are split in four um, phases or areas, crafting, embedding, executing, and sustaining. Um, so yeah, that's where you're going to be learning if you join the course. And we have still some promotions uh, offering a 50% discount. So it's uh, here you find the prices there inside. Uh, you, the best offer, of course, is always the bundle where you get the course and the certification at the same time. The course is valid for 90 days, the magic 90 days. And then you're ready to take the exam from APMG. You know, Antonio, I'm smiling because we had to put scan me under the QR code because prior to COVID, people weren't so familiar with it. I think we can delete that now. Everyone's used to QR codes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Antonio. Ricky, can I invite yes, you? Have to thank you. Yeah, thank you. And before I have the absolute pleasure of introducing our speaker, our first speaker today, Richard Farrow, I want to just remind you of the, the um, breakout conversations that you'll be having today, because we've got about 18 to 20 minutes on those. And if you, if you have a look at these four points here, I want you to really focus on um, the most important, which is number two and number three. That goes without saying, of course, you've got to remember which group you're in uh, and you already know that you've got to select a leader so they're, they're two givens 
But this is where it's different from the last couple of nights where we've just been talking about in general and pulling out key points. Today is different because today we want you to discuss the themes of the future of strategy implementation. And those themes that have come to your mind and what you believe is going to be important for the future, that is what I want you to land on. So when you come back into the bigger conversation and that will be put together in the white paper, you're actually going to really select one theme to share and why, here's the kicker, why it's important, not just the theme, but why. And, and the whole, you know, conversations that we're having these days is all around the why, isn't it? Um, and I, I think we've got to make sure that we make this very, very um, much a part of the work that we do. So once again, um, and we'll do this again later on, but make sure when you go into the breakout room, you, sh you absolutely discuss the themes and then you select one thing to share and why that's that's important. Okay, I think we've got it. So let's get down to business now. And it's my greatest pleasure to introduce Richard Farrow to you, who I've had the pleasure of having a very informal chat with um, as we were starting. And I love his humour and I love the fact that he's easy to chat with. And I'm looking forward to now Robin interviewing him. And I feel this Antonio. conversation... Antonio is going to interview. Oh, Antonio, sorry. Antonio is going to introduce him, uh, interview him. And, and what I love about this conversation is the naturalness of what I feel is going to be there. So let me just briefly tell you a little bit more about Richard, and I'm sure he'll tell you a whole lot more and put it into context. Um, he's the founder and CEO of APMG International, and his company is one of the few privately owned international accreditation certification bodies which was started in 1995 and now has, has expanded its management portfolio to 66 products across 14 countries around the management spectrum. Richard believes APMG's success, apart from his leadership, I'm sure, which is, <laughs> is due to the organisation's focus on innovation and customer service. He was delighted when APMG gained its Investors in People Gold Award in 2010. And the, beauty, the beautiful thing is he's retained it ever since. He's recognised, he's been recognised the hard work and commitment of everyone within his organisation. And it's a tribute to you as a leader, Richard. In 2012, APMG also won the Queen's Award for Enterprise in the International Trade category. And with his credentials, I feel he is certainly king of customer service. So please, Antonio and Richard, I'm very much interested in your conversation as I know everybody else is. Over to you. Thank you very Thank much, you, Ricky. Ricky. I think I should probably uh, finish now because <laughs> I'm not sure I could top that introduction. <laughs> it sure is recorded. Can. We can sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the intro and Richard, it's a pleasure to be with you here and, and thank you for accepting our, our invitation. Uh, the idea is just to have an informal discussion and let me just get started to the point. What do you think is the future of strategy implementation? So, hmm, I think the future is going to be uh, very different than in the past. So I think the concept of three and five year strategic plans is a thing of the past. I mean, if you think about the life of a company now, you know, about 50 years ago, the average life of a company was probably what, 60, 70 years. It's now probably less than 20. And I think some McKinsey research said, you know, in the next five or six years, three quarters of the S&P 500 will no longer exist. So, how can you de develop a long-term strategy in these very turbulent times? So I think there's going to be a direction of travel, but I think strategic plans are going to have to be much shorter. They're going to have to be more flexible and we're going to have to deliver them in a much more responsive and agile way. And I think as the um, quiz we just saw, gone are the days when the board could pontificate on a strategy and hand it down through the organization. 
and then get frustrated because it hadn't been enacted and move on to the next strategy. There has to be much closer relationship between all parts of the organization. But the also key thing, sorry, Antonio, no, I think one of the challenges most businesses have is to stop doing things that no longer fit into the strategy and to get the people that are really passionate about doing the old thing to realize you've got to do something different. And that's a very human problem. And uh, let me take you a bit to my field, which I know you're one of the experts in project program. Um, you've developed the whole Prince too for the whole world and make it uh, so big. Uh, what, what is the future of projects and project management in this space? And there's many people work coming from the project management space in our members. And what's your view of being such an expert in the topic? Well, if you think about it, the way you deliver the strategy is through projects. But then I would say that, and I suppose everybody on this call would say that. But if it's about bringing in organizational change, new products, new direction, then clearly the role of projects becomes much more important. But unfortunately, over the last 50 years, the project management community hasn't actually filled itself with glory. Yeah, you know, there are still the same, roughly the same percentage of projects failing now as they were failing 50 years ago. You know, and the reasons for failure are the same as they have been for the last 30, 40, 50 years. So there's, there's something not quite right about why there is such a high proportion of project failures. And it's very hard to think of any other profession that would survive if it had the same percentage of failures as we have in project management. Now, I believe that one of the biggest problems is the project sponsor or the project owner, because if the project was really that critical to the organization and the project had the resources, the time, whatever it needed to be delivered appropriately, then maybe we would increase the, the number of successes. And if it's the sponsors tend to be higher up in the organization, then that link between strategy, sponsor, and execution implementation through projects should be tighter, with a clear focus on benefits and the outturn. And because of that, I think we should see more successes. But you can't Thank deliver you. a strategy without projects. I think that's, uh, that's music to our ears, Richard. I think it's... I say it's the time now for, for project change implementation specialists. Uh, so I think that kind of really aligns with, with the research as well that I'm doing on, on this space. And, but we cannot afford the, the, the failure rates that we see in projects or strategy implementation. Absolutely but there is, agree. But and so there's also possibly something about the, um, when it comes to benefits realization, on, in terms of the project, there's a disconnect between the life cycle of the project sponsor and the life cycle of delivering the benefits. Mm. And maybe we need to have something like, instead of a project management office or program management office, a strategy management office, where the benefits of the projects and the programs are owned and tracked and accountability rests. Like it, yes. I think we we do have a section in our course that talks about the strategy implementation office, and that the PMOs or the project management office that we've known so far, either they upgrade and move into that space, or they will be obsolete very quickly. So hmm. I couldn't agree more with you, Richard. Um, can I use a bit this time to also? Uh, you saw the wave of agile coming in, and I think you you also probably. Uh, made it happen uh, with so many certifications. What happened then and can we replicate that with the strategy implementation? Is, is that could be a tipping point, could be something that we, will, the next big thing after Agile? Um, I think, you know, for me, Agile like project management, it, it's um, tools and processes are very, very important. But I think the key thing in Agile is mindset. 
it's are you willing to work in an agile way you know, are you willing to embrace the risk you know the the try fail fast approach and there's no reason why that should be constrained to projects and programs i mean we're seeing a lot more interest in agile so there's the development work i think was in Scandinavia about beyond budgeting, you know, to move away from annual financial budgets to more um, reactive, responsive budgets in terms of what um, organizations need to spend their money on. You know, so what does agile HR look like? What does agile marketing look like? And I think it is about aligning what we do with the strategy of the organization and doing it as quickly and as effectively as we possibly can. So, but I think agile, like project management, could get hijacked. You know, you and I will both remember the times when projects used to be about significant investment, and then people would talk about, you know, a project could be six weeks or two weeks, and a project could be a young child tidying their bedroom and those sorts of things. You know, and if it's agile in name only then it's probably going to lose its flavor. But you know, Agile strategy for me would just be um, a, a continuous review of strategy and a reaction to market conditions that embraces the whole organization. So the organization targets and objectives are always aligned and always reviewed. Um, and I think Agile fits within that very, very well. And can we make from strategy implementation the next big thing? How do you see it? Is there potential? I think there is potential because, again, if you think of a career structure, you know, if I'm experienced in projects and programs, where do I go to next? What is my next learning? What is my next continuous learning, continuous development? it could be into that strategic direction of the organization. But with people working in more diverse ways, working in more project teams, smaller teams, people then need to have a clear understanding of the strategic direction with all the clients that they may be working for on that contract basis. Yeah. And if an organization only lasts for say seven years in the future, then if you're not aligned to strategy, if you can't think strategy, and if you're a project manager, you can't talk the language of business and you can't engage at the board, then it's going to be quite a lonely life for a lot of people. So I think people will move towards that strategic intent to really understand where they fit and to help the organizations for whom they're working at the time um find a position and succeed in that position so there's no reason why the you know, strategy implementation institute couldn't be bigger than both pmi and ipma put together thank you richard we didn't plan this but it sounds really good <laughs> <laughs> one question more for me richard maybe i think it's interesting for but we just came into this um, education market one year ago uh, have you, why there was nothing like this? There's a lot on project program, uh, benefit managing probably is the closest that you can see, then a lot of agile scrum and so on. But why or how come, or what's your guess? Why just us came right now a year ago and, and that space was not covered when it makes so much sense? I think it needs the visionary. You know, it needs someone like you and Robin who understand this market to put something together that is credible. I mean, one of the things that we found working over the last 25 years is you have to work with a credible, what we would call a scheme owner. You know, people or an organization that has you know, the right to own the content, the right to say, this is what good strategy looks like. And of course, the willingness to adapt and change that as things in the world adapt and change around it. Um, but I think it's that people always thought about strategy was a top of the office thing, that people set strategy. 
and the board tended to get angry the strategy wasn't being executed but nobody actually thought through well maybe there's a problem with giving the resources to the execution of the strategy and i think with your background and with robin's background you can see that that gap is there and as we know from the certification program you, know, you can actually learn an awful lot in a relatively short period of time to make a significant difference to your ability to execute on that strategy implementation. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> I never asked you that question, but it's in my mind. We talk very regularly. Uh, Rich, just kind of for information to the audience, how many certifications or accreditations have APMG provides over the years? Uh, I think the number of certificates in the world with an APMG logo is somewhere between two and three million. Not bad. And most of those are in the world in program project management, in service management, in change management, and they're now starting to grow in strategy management <laughs> and cybersecurity. So, uh, but they are in the um, all in that management space. Yeah. And now, of course, in the agile space, no, and I'm yeah. seeing them grow. And and a bit uh, just to finish and then open up for question, Richard. How do you see? There's been a bit of debate on career degrees for this kind of world changing fast, and they seem to be very obsolete. And and you see Google and uh, creating their own certifications and all degrees, and they don't care what you study. Uh, as an expert in this field, for us as yeah, we want to keep growing. And, and how do you see that for us, for companies, this evolution of, of credentials versus traditional degrees or? I think it's, um, it comes down to what do you get out of a degree? We see this debate at the moment. You have people at university and not at university because of COVID-19. So if you think that gaining the degree is about sort of a life-changing experience, new experiences, new people, new subjects, it's hard to see that ending. So I think degrees, people will still aspire the degree in order to, to get into the workplace. But the importance of them, I think, is, is declining in some areas. And I can see that as business change, as industries change, as technology changes, lifelong learning is probably more important today than it was maybe 50 years ago when the world of work wasn't changing so much. So, you know, if you think about a university will have a research department, but a university would struggle to keep up with the research and development that's carried on by somebody like Google or Amazon. So organizations that are leaders in their field, providing education to help all of us maintain a knowledge and keep up to date, I think is very powerful and I, I can only see that growing. I think the challenge though, is how do you demonstrate that you have that knowledge? So, and I would say this, wouldn't I? But the, the value of the certification is evidence that you have that knowledge. And if you think there's more people now are working remotely, so the global talent pool is available to anybody. So you don't have to live in the same city. You don't even have to live in the same country. So how do you demonstrate to somebody that you have the competence or the capability to do the role? And one simple way of doing that is through certifications. And at least it will get you to that interview and being able to show that you have that knowledge. Now, I was very surprised recently. I read a piece that uh, someone was interviewing software engineers. And the people came from the university he went to and they were learning the same stuff he was learning 20 years ago, allegedly. So why would you want a software engineer whose basic knowledge is 20 years out of date? And, and I think that is a challenge, but having said that, with distance learning, with online courses, with MOOCs, I don't think we will ever replace the value of a human to inspire and motivate us to learn. 
So I think education courses can go online, but I think the human body, the human mind needs that external stimulus from a world-class teacher and educator to really inspire people to, to develop themselves over a long lifetime of different activities. And every now and again, get a certification. Thank you, Richard. I, I never hire anybody working in a PMO for me or a consultant without a certification, mm. uh, PMP, APMG. And, and I think our vision is that no manager should be made manager or hire without the strategy implementation mm. uh, professional because they are all in charge of implementation. So I think we share that kind of vision uh, with you, Richard. <clears throat> I don't have more questions, Richard. So I don't know, Robin, do you want to open up for questions or we do uh, yeah, Marvin please do. first? Please, uh, why don't we open up for questions and uh, Marvin's joined us and we'll, in about five, 10 minutes, we'll switch over. But let's give uh, the audience an opportunity to have a chat. Perfect, I'll check a bit the questions here. Um, Maybe instead of me reading, why don't you come up here uh, and, and put the question to Richard? Just be concise, please. Uh, and the first question I see here is from a good friend and a partner, Sadi, Dr. Sadi. Can you put the question to, to Richard? I think he may have left. He sent a message saying he had to go. Do you want? Okay. Do you want so me we to have it? Yeah, you can repeat it, please. I cannot. So on behalf of uh, Dr. Sadi, who's one of our partners based out of Lebanon, he asks, uh, Richard, Agile for IT and software, we have Scrum and others, a lot of them. Uh, most universities are dealing with giga projects to undergo the phase of gate process and enjoy attributes of Agile, but not what is offered within the current certification system. So I guess what he's saying is the education is lagging behind what organizations need. Will we have a certification on organizational agility in the very near future, rather than agile methods based on IT? So he's asking, will we be able to introduce organizational agility as a certification? Do you see that on the horizon? I can see that coming within the next few days. So um, in the UK, we work with the Agile Business Consortium that has a wide range of programs we offer on their behalf on project management and business analysis. We're also due to launch a business agility program that actually was developed in Singapore, which looks at how do you take agility outside of the IT house. And it was developed in one of the universities in Singapore because businesses were saying, don't talk to us about Scrum and don't talk to us about Kanban, how does Agile apply throughout the rest of the organization? And we're about to launch an online course with a certification. I think it's due to hit the streets in February. And it will be one of, I think, three or three courses, two or three courses in that program. So definitely, yes. Thank you. The next question, I'll take the next one. Tom uh, Bloomers, Tom, do you want to put your question? Sure. Um, thanks very much, Antonio. Uh, Richard, the question I have is, um, how do you think we can stimulate more people to invest in organizational or in lifelong learning instead of what I see a lot is people simply burying their head in the sand and closing their eyes to all the change and uh, that is coming their way? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure I have a magic bullet for that, Tom. I think it is about, I suppose it's really breaking down what we mean by learning. So I think it is about giving people opportunity and giving them sufficient knowledge to enable them to get started. But if you think about it, most of our most of us learnt by doing. So it's how do you create that environment? where you can give somebody the opportunity, you can trust them to try to do something, they do it as a low risk, and then based on the success, they move forward. I mean, I think it will be very hard for me in my business to sign off on sending someone off on an MBA for two years. 
which may have been something we would have done a few years ago, but to actually create project teams and give people that opportunity to learn, do something and then grow as an individual, uh, we do that and I can see us doing more than that. And maybe what we should be looking is organizations in an ecosystem where people could work for another organization for a short period of time in order to get that wider experience. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Tom, for the question. I'll pick up one more. Emma Vernon, do you want to uh, uh, share your question with Richard? Emma? Thank you, Antonio, and thank you, Richard. Um, Richard, I just wondered, I think we talked a little bit in your presentation around how strategy is seen at the boardroom level. Do you think there's anything that leaders can do to make strategy and its implementation feel more accessible across the organization? I suppose it is about that, uh, that age old problem of communication, communication, communication. And it's at what point do you share that strategy through the rest of the organization? <clears throat> so I think someone's got to do some initial thinking, but then having that thinking and outline cascade it down through the organization so more people can feed back in on what it should look like. But then how long can you take to evolve it if you've got to get that strategy into operation and execution to meet a market design? So I think it is this evolution. I think, as I said earlier, if people started thinking quarterly reports and quarterly revisions and quarterly updates, then maybe the organizations could get some real momentum behind them. Now that works for a lot of organizations. Not sure how it works with people doing major capital projects, but uh, that's what I think it is. It's about more communication, more iteration, and more um, joined up thinking throughout the whole organization. Thank, Thank you. you, Emma. Thank you, Richard. I'll take the last one so we finish quarter two and then I'll, I'll pass on to Robin. Uh, last question, I'm just picking up. There's a few more that we can still address during the breakouts. I take here, Karel Nkunga. Can you just, Karel, share your question? Hi, yeah, I'm speaking uh, for myself who is still trying to get into the project management industry so right now I'm educating myself so my question is how does one get the opportunity to demonstrate their competence in strategic um, strategic implementation or and after you know would it start by getting the qualification and certification and then once you get that certification what's the next step to get an opportunity in the workplace. Thank you. That, that's, that's quite a hard question to answer. It all depends, I think, on where you work. Because I think what, what's always a good thing is to volunteer to do things. So can you volunteer to join a internal focus group, a small project team doing something where you can demonstrate your capability and through demonstrating your capability and having that experience, maybe you move on to, to big, bigger things. Having said that, I think getting the education to understand the language and be able to speak the language is quite important. And if you can speak the language of strategy, then people will recognize you can speak the language of strategy and give you the bigger opportunity. But if you don't speak the right language, if you can't understand the conversation going on within the team, then I think it becomes quite difficult to be recognized. So I think some education, understand the terminology and the language, and then basically put your head above the parapet, as we would say in the UK, try and stand out and ask for the opportunity. I know a lawyer in America who was a very, very junior lawyer many years ago, and the senior partner was retained by the then president of the United States to be the legal counsel. And this young lawyer knocked on his door and said, please take me with you. And he spent two years in the White House as a legal attorney because he asked for the opportunity. Be brave and ask for the opportunity, but make sure you can speak the language. <laughs> like it, Richard. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Carl, for the question. 
and and you touch upon one point, Richard. It's it's in our in our plans uh, coming again from the PMI world where volunteering is so important and and providing those opportunities for people to do things that they don't do somewhere else. So in our plan is to develop the volunteers around the Strategy Implementation Institute. This is a bit early. We'll be discussing that in our monthly calls with the with the members, but it's a big point in our in our plans to have that network of volunteers to offer them opportunities to 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 support us and learn new things, apply these these new things in reality. So uh, just because we touch upon that, it just uh, light a, a, a bulb in my head. But Richard, I want to thank you. It's always a pleasure hearing uh, talking to you. I could go for hours. So many questions, so many learnings. Uh, it's great to have you as a partner um, and, and sharing that vision that Robin and I had a few years ago. It, it's probably one of the best endorsements that we can think of uh, having you as an active sponsor. We're doing a lot of activity with APMG uh, advisors as well, uh, coming next very soon as well. So thank you, Richard, very, very much on behalf of uh, Robin and myself for being here today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Robin. What a, what a great pleasure to, to hear you speak, Richard. And um, you, you, the way in which you round that up just shows that communication really is everybody's responsibility. And thank you very much. It's been a pleasure hearing you speak. So now I'd thank like you. to go from one brilliant leader to another, and I'm excited to introduce Marvin Tan, Senior Vice President of Product and Services for Singapore Airlines, who's going to be interviewed by Robin. In Marvin's current role, he is responsible for so many amazing things, only a few of which I will tell you because the list is endless. He is in, in responsible for airport operations, customer affairs, customer contact services, ground experience and development. And there's so much more we're all wrapped around that. And given his wide experience that goes well beyond the shores of Singapore to UK and Ireland, Vietnam, Japan, Taiwan, many other places, he's demonstrated a firm commitment to excellence over the years. He's also served on the board of Virgin Australia Holdings Limited and as a board director for Scoot Proprietary Limited. So when it comes to the customer, I think you'll agree with me that Marvin knows firsthand what it takes to create experiences, not just explanations. So Robin, we'd love to hand it over to you to unpack some of Marvin's talents and share with us and, and make sure that we can learn um, and implement. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ricky. Marvin, it's absolutely a delight to have you. So thank you for taking the time out. It's good to see you fit and healthy because I know just the other day you had your second vaccine. So I'm glad there were no side effects. And just before we kick off, I just ask, uh, you may want to switch to speaker view so that you get the full picture and you get to see Marvin. So what's uh, my delight is that Marvin has done an amazing job as have Singapore Airlines over the last, uh, especially over the last year, never mind the brand they have developed. But we all know that the airline industry was challenged more than any other industry, where to go and see your business drop by 98% almost overnight is just you know something none of us could really manage uh, to even think about, never mind deal with. And what's going to be our pleasure is to hear from Marvin about just how Singapore Airlines responded to that challenge and what is currently going on. Marvin, would you like to say hi to everyone? Sure, Thank, thanks uh, so much, Robin, and thanks to Ricky as well for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I'm glad to uh, meet everyone in cyberspace and uh, to share whatever I can from Singapore Airlines experience over the past year or so. I guess, obviously, in the context of strategy implementation, but more strategy pivoting, strategy change along the way, given uh, the massive disruption to our industry and really, I suppose, to almost uh, anybody's line of work these days. Okay. Marvin, as always, you're as humble as ever, but let me kick off with a question that I'm sure many people are wondering, which is almost to the day, it's almost like 12 months to the day, yeah. when we went into lockdown here in Singapore and your, your industry and the airline was hit so badly by what was going on. 
what happened? What was the reaction? What was the atmosphere? What was the thinking among the leaders when this happened? Can you share? Sure. Well, actually, the, the whole situation unfolded for us even before the lockdown in Singapore. I think, Robin, if you remember, we went into well, our version of a lockdown, uh, euphemistically called a circuit breaker uh, in uh, April last year. But actually, everything started already from February and March when all the borders started to close. And uh, we were put in, a, obviously, a very difficult situation where we had passengers stranded all over the place. We we're trying to figure out which flights we could actually operate and carry people. Um, everything was very fluid at that point in time. Uh, frankly, we thought worst case scenario, SARS, you know, from 2003, where it took us maybe six to nine months to recover. But obviously, a year down from that point, it's clearly been an, a very, very different scenario altogether. So at that point in time, it really was just trying to figure out the uh, operational issues and what we could do to respond uh, in the immediate term. And over time, over the months, over the rest of 2020, we really started to have to take a look at the slightly longer term picture because it was obvious that this pandemic was not going to go away. Okay. And well, it's famous, absolutely, it's certainly not going anywhere. Um, how did you redirect your resources? So, I mean, from suddenly having all the planes on the ground, and we know, you know, planes on the ground cost money, planes in the air make money, to suddenly having to redirect your, your resources, uh, looking at, you know, the capital investment in the aircraft sitting on the ground. What was going on around that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. It's obviously a tough one. Uh, we can't go to a secondhand dealer, you know, to try to move the planes. I mean, they, they are heavy capital investments that will be with us for years. So it really was to see what we could do with all our planes uh, during this period of time. Uh, the air freight market was still relatively healthy, um, particularly new lines of business carrying masks from all around the world and now with vaccines. So certainly we had to pivot to a greater focus on ensuring we can maximize our revenue from cargo and air freight, even while the passenger uh, business, as you mentioned, dropped about 98 to 99%. Yeah, so ultimately, uh, our two biggest assets, our planes, our capital uh, investments, and our people. You know, so what do we do with our people during this period of time? Uh, that was probably the hardest decision that we had to make. The planes are where they are. And we're waiting. So what was the decision? How did you manage with the people, both the cabin crew, the apron and the grind staff and the, the corporate staff? Yeah, I mean, this is the toughest situation. I think any company that's severely affected by the pandemic has to go through. Um, don't have to cover all that. I think many of the participants have read in the media about the industry in general. For us, we had to shed about 15% of our workforce. You know, clearly, when you're down 98, 99% of your usual, usual traffic, you have no choice. Um, but with the remaining folks, two things. One, obviously, we still wanted to maintain some level of readiness because things were so uncertain. You never know when some shoots of recovery might appear. And we're such a technical industry that you can't get capability up and running in a couple of months. When you're talking about your pilots, you're talking about your cabin crew, your engineers, these are folks you have to keep on board as a core enablers of the business. You know, so we had to bear that in mind. But then we've got these folks. So what do we do in a time when most of our planes are grounded and our operating level is at about maybe 10 to 20% of what our pre-COVID capacity had been? And uh, we, we did a lot of things. Uh, first of all, for, for just taking an example of our cabin crew, clearly they're service professionals. So we took the opportunity since there was a need for them in many other sectors in Singapore, for example, in healthcare. You know, we actually redeployed them with the government support so that they could go out to the hospitals, uh, they could go out to healthcare facilities and use their service training uh, and put that to good use and to help out the community. Uh, and that, to be fair, the uh, Singapore government has been very supportive in enabling job support you know, for a lot of companies affected by COVID uh, and certainly were one of the recipients. But in return, we want to make sure that we used our talent, our resources on hand to be able to support other parts of what the, com uh, the government was trying to do as well. Uh, nicely said, thank you. And, you know, what the cabin crew did, you know, going into hospitals was just fantastic. And one of the things you corrected me on when we last caught up was I, I made the statement that you must have made a complete change to your strategy, but you said it wasn't a complete change. So I'm curious if you could share, you know, how did you cope with, you know, how much of the strategy did change and what was the thinking? 
Yeah, in, in some ways, ironically, our strategy, the long-term reason for being for Singapore Airlines is still there to provide air transport services of the highest quality. Yeah, that hasn't changed. It's just that the external circumstances have, have uh, meant a, a severe impact on our business. But moving forward, uh, the demand is still there. No one's, invest, no one's invented any transporter technology yet, nothing like Star Trek you know, to get uh, people and things moving from A to B just like that. So I think airlines still have a role to play, but clearly we have to think, start thinking about what air travel means in the future based on our own research from what we understand from speaking with people in industry and outside. Uh, actually, leisure demand is expected to recover a, a little bit more quickly, uh, largely because folks want to go on their holidays. Yeah, and you can see this in places like China, especially when uh, you look at domestic travel, which has largely recovered in China. And it only took them a couple of months to get capacity levels back to about 90 to 95 percent of what you used to be pre-COVID. Yeah. So people do want to travel. The interesting for us thing for us to look out for, which is sort of related to what we're doing now, is business travel. Uh, so what part of business travel will uh, come back, will recover uh, in relation to what it had been, you know, do it's likely that some business travel will be replaced by video conferencing, yeah, but there are still many aspects of business travel which are still very important in terms of ensuring uh, personal contact, face-to-face -face contact, especially when you deal with uh, major business deals, investment decisions. So those are the things we have to bear in mind in terms of how we want to, for example, configure our fleet in the future in terms of the different types of products, which are obviously very tailored to meet certain travel segments. And if I can ask you to add on, one of the things you mentioned when we were preparing for today was you mentioned that they will start, you'll start rather than trying to do everything at once in what you call bubbles with different countries. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you to expand on that, please? Yes, uh, we actually, we tried uh, towards the end of last year uh, at the state level, Singapore and Hong Kong tried to launch an air travel bubble between uh, these two countries largely because at that point in time, the pandemic situation was relatively under control. But unfortunately, towards the year end, we saw the number of cases start to rise in Hong Kong. And, it, and because of that, we felt it was uh, more prudent to then just suspend uh, the air travel bubble. It would have just meant passengers being able to, or travelers being able to move between the two countries with some minimal testing, uh, but certainly without uh, the real big problem that uh, I think the industry faces now, which is the quarantine. Nobody is going to spend 14 days in a hotel just to go on a couple of days holiday. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. So that was a, a plan. It's been put aside for now because of obviously the public health situation. But with vaccines uh, on the horizon, uh, with the possibility that certain countries, I think in the UK, I think it's, it's very encouraging to read the progress of vaccination uh, that's happening there. You might be able to start to see vaccine-enabled travel bubbles uh, forming between countries. But you know, we'll have to see how that goes because obviously it's, it's very fluid uh, and clearly it, it being the right thing to do. We know that public health authorities are giving um, uh, priority for the vaccines to those who are more vulnerable. Travel really is a secondary consideration. But as this gets rolled out more broadly across the community, it could be one of the things that could help uh, the, the pace of recovery. Okay. And if you don't mind, I'm going to switch the question um, towards digital. And we all know that you know, every cloud is a silver lining. And one of the benefits of COVID has been the rapid acceleration of digital and acceptance in the community, customers, and organizations. How has that impacted Singapore Airlines in its digital journey, in the acceleration and the speed of which we're now seeing customers more comfortable in using digital? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. And we are quite fortunate because we went on our digital transformation journey a couple of years before COVID hit us obviously without COVID in mind. And through our experience in trying to manage the pandemic, it's been quite, it's been quite clear that uh, we would not have been able to cope with some of the severe circumstances if we had not gone down the path of things like deploy more self-service, more automation uh, to help us deal with our operations better. There's no way we could have handled the hundreds and thousands of refunds that popped up within the span of a couple of weeks. Uh, because of COVID, uh, if we didn't have some form of automation. And more importantly, if we didn't set up the organizational structure in place to drive that application development. It took us two weeks to come up with a web portal for folks to submit their refund, refund uh, requests online. Uh, if you do it through the phones, 
we wouldn't have never gotten to them you know at the rate at which we did clearly it wasn't perfect but it's the entire uh, value proposition for digital you know you start with something you build on it you learn from it and then you progress it and you start to use it to apply for other situations as well Okay, thank you. Nicely put. Um, I've got a couple more questions, and then there's questions coming in left, right, and center on the chat room. Sure. But um, we've got a few more minutes. So, um, one of the things I'd like to hear is, is you know, you've just sat, well, I mean, you, you previously you sat down to consider 2021. There are mm -hmm. so many unknown factors for you going into the year. How is it possible to even think about putting in a strategy? What, what were, you know, how did you even think about planning and going ahead with this year? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. I, I think it's not the challenge of, of any scenario. It's the challenge that we don't know what that scenario is. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. The situation for our business is certainly so fluid because we are at the mercy of borders. Yeah, without which really, with the opening without which really we can't uh, look at really any meaningful recovery for the industry as a whole. So in terms of strategy implementation, I think we approach it twofold. One, for the aspects of the business, which is really more survival oriented, it's really keeping the lights on and doing uh, enough expenditure in those areas just to make sure the business runs. But the other part of it, which also goes back to the whole digital um, landscape, the, the whole digital approach, is to invest in things that you know will be important for the business in the long term. Uh, looking at building up our website, our mobile capability, looking at helping our crew uh, our staff also do their jobs better by de and deploying more automation, looking at things like uh, robotics process, you know, uh, uh, analysis, just things of that nature that can really, really help the business in the long run. Those are the investment decisions we still continue to make. And if, if I can add on, I know they're very minor compared to, to your core business, but for us in Singapore, we also saw you... Um, you launched uh, the meals on board, uh, yes, the planes, that's right. and also the service excellence courses. Do you want to just mention those yes. briefly? Sure. Well, well, the the uh, the A three A T restaurant. We felt, felt why not do it since we got the plane on ground, anyways. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think to be very frank, that's more a customer engagement opportunity for us. You know, so you as need a needle mover. Any of them won't yeah. know what it was. Yeah, okay. well, we basically ran a restaurant using our A380 plane, you know, the big double deckers with almost 500 seats uh, on ground and invited uh, passengers uh, to, to have an experience. And obviously, our crew were deployed to serve on board the planes. It was a three hour experience. They could use the in flight entertainment. But it really was more a way for us to continue to have some engagement with our customers rather than a real needle mover in terms of revenue. And more importantly, it also gave our staff a chance to be active. Uh, to keep the morale up for them to have something meaningful for them to do because obviously particularly for the cabin crew and uh, for example uh, their flying has been severely severely reduced yeah thank you and we i just have um a few questions coming up but one key one is so what are the lessons that you personally have taken away from the experience of the last 12 14 months yeah i mean it's it's i guess we're still learning uh, that's a good way to put it uh, Probably the most important thing, certainly if we are to look at COVID and obviously this is, you could call it a black swan event and no business can really ever prepare itself fully for something like this. You know, you, I don't think you can invest in a business to have it run to deal with a black swan event, but certainly in terms of the disruption that's faced uh, and maybe seeing smaller disruptions of such nature and how we could better respond to them in the future, it will be the les lessons of resilience uh, of agility, which I think will be important to any organization. And what can we do as a, as a company to enable that? Again, through digitalization, you know, through having a workforce that's a lot more flexible, um, to build that flexibility into, into how folks uh, do their learning and development so that they can be redeployed if necessary. So these are things I think have become even more important to us in the last year and things that we will focus on for, for the organization moving forward. Well, hopefully you'll never need to uh, call on them to this extent again. Um, a couple of questions yeah. coming through, Marvin, if you don't mind, and we appreciate your time. Sure, sure. No, no problem. For you. Um, the, one of the questions is, what level in, of engagement are you expecting from the staff once you start uh, back to some form of normality? 
Um, how, what level of engagement are you expecting and how are you going to manage that with your people? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting question because in a way, oddly enough, during this period, we end up actually engaging with more of our folks than we did pre-COVID. And let me explain. Uh, we've got a big workforce uh, outside of Singapore. You know, if, if I leave out our cabin crew and our flight crew who ob obviously fly around, we've got a lot of folks who work uh, outside of Singapore you know, in all the 60 plus countries that we operate to. Frankly, in the past, we would maybe see them once a year, you know, once every two years when we have a conference and it's just largely emails. But through this, because actually many of our folks are stranded, they can't move around that quickly. We use Zoom, we use Teams, we use WebEx to stay in touch more regularly than what we did before. So it's, and it's given us uh, increased renewed importance to, to understand uh, this need to, to have that session. Sometimes you don't even need to have a proper agenda, particularly in the service field when you're talking about motivation of staff, uh, keeping spirits up when obviously there, there's no operations to a particular station at this point in time. You know, you've got to keep that engagement going. And it's something that certainly that we've learned during this period and it's something that we are taking on, on board as a part of what we want to do as SOP moving forward. Okay, thank you. And um, just last couple of questions. One is around how has the board reacted and supported you through this? The uh, no, the, uh, yeah, yeah. I, one good thing, I, the board certainly is uh, one extremely important part of writing. But the other part of it, obviously, is our shareholders. And uh, most of you will know that uh, Termasic Holdings, which is a Singapore sovereign wealth fund, yeah, is our majority shareholder. Uh, they've always taken a long-term view of the company and this industry. So uh, when we had to do our capital raising last year, uh, they stepped forward to give us a lot of support. So that was very, very important. Yeah, And I think when you mentioned, uh, Robin, how we are doing our strategization, strat you know, how we are planning our strategy this year for 2021 moving forward. If you don't have that long-term backing in a situation like this, it's very, very hard. And I cannot blame some of uh, our other peers in industry for having to do a lot more severe short-term uh, actions or measures because they don't. if you don't have that backing, it's very, very difficult. Okay. Um, there's just one more quick question that came in. Um, I'm going to squeeze in, which is, is the, from Yolanda, is the industry doing any collaboration so across the, the you know across the uh, other airlines, are you collaborating with them in any form or manner? Well, we, we do have an industry body, uh, I, uh, IATA, yeah, the International Air Transport Association, who's actually been quite active in trying to uh, band together the interests of all airlines in engaging governments, uh, government agencies, uh, other uh, industry bodies. So I think across the airlines, uh, it's it's quite it's not very difficult to outline what are some of the common objectives, you know, trying to get borders open in a safe way, uh, looking at implementation of uh, more consistent health safety measures yeah, across countries, across airports, so that uh, passengers can, and customers, travelers can have confidence in the whole air travel experience. So all those things are underway. I think what we do uh, are trying to work on, again, if we go back to the digital theme, we're trying to see, are there ways to help us better manage all the documentation and all the requirements that all the countries are implementing now. So for example, we are working with IATA, I think together with uh, airlines like BA to see if we can have like a digital health certificate so that all the testing requirements are then digitalized so that we can very easily check these when just before prior to travel. And eventually these could potentially flow into the airline system. So it's all automated. So a passenger doesn't actually need to present anything when they check in because we all know that everything is done and dusted in the background. But clearly something like this, you need a lot of stakeholders on board. Uh, the, the, the desire and interest is there. Now we need to get the will and the time and the investment. So, so those are the types of things that as an industry, I think we, if we work on and we achieve, it will deliver a lot of value, not only to others, but obviously to, to travelers in general. And if I can add on one of the other companies that we both know that you're working with is Simply Flying, who has created the accreditation for the health on board and Shawshank, I think, who's on the call with us tonight, uh, today, you know, as part of that. So, you know, it was good to see also in the Singapore press the accreditation that you've received in being safe and health on board. And one very quick final question, if we can, you can just give us a quick answer on it, which is, sure. when do you think we'll be back to pre-COVID uh, life on board? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, uh, let, let me just uh, shake my little crystal ball next to me and uh, see if you can give me a yes or no answer. Uh, that's really the billion dollar question, you know. Uh, if you, if you, again, if, if I sort of take the official position, you look at what Ayata is saying, they're looking at maybe 2024, you know, as a recovery to pre-COVID levels of uh, air travel. Um, but really, it's anybody's guess at this point in time. Unfortunately, as we've seen over the last one or two months, uh, the public health situation has taken a step back. You know, so we had some hopes for some border opening, but those things have to, to be parked aside. So things are still quite fluid. Again, we see some healthier trends in domestic travel, particularly within countries where the pandemic has come under control. So that gives us some encouragement that there is still the desire to move. That people want to still go places. Yeah, and we just need to uh, keep at it. Um, we're trying very hard on things like vaccination. So even for Singapore Airlines, for example, we're working very hard to uh, get our employees uh, to uh, maybe about 90% of them to be vaccinated you know, over the course of the next couple of months so that at least uh, we protect our staff, we take care of their welfare, but they in at the same time, you can also give travelers the confidence that we are doing everything we can as part of a big package of measures to ensure uh, tra air travel's health safety. Wonderful. On that note, Marvin, Thank you very much for giving us your time the, uh, today to share with the participants because we're all fascinated by what's going on and you've done extremely well to manage through very tough challenges. Marvin Tan, Senior VP Singapore Airlines, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you for sharing your insights. Thank, thanks, Robin, and thanks, thanks to everyone. I wish everyone a, a successful rest of the conference. Thank you, Marvin. Yep, thank you. Fantastic. I, I'm so excited and wow, I just can't wait to come back to Singapore and in, enjoy the hospitality of the airline because now I now know who stands behind it and what it stands for. So Thank that you. was it was a pleasure to, to hear and I learned so much from what goes on behind the scenes that we often don't don't see or take for granted. So let's, it's quarter past the hour and um, we've got 45 minutes till the end of this conference. So we've got to really get um, to work on um, discussing the themes of the future of strategy implementation over the course of the next um, little while. And then remember coming back to the, the whole plenary to talk about one thing to share and why that's important. Um, so as we go to the breakout rooms, remember your group number select your leader and let's get rolling because there's some tremendous opportunities here to document for the uh, for the white paper. Um, the, this white paper, don't forget, it's really important that this is going to be the catalyst for the uh, monthly meetings that are going to happen on the first Tuesday of every month starting from next month. So this input is going to really um, capitalise um, down the track. So welcome back uh, for the last part of the three-day conference. So um, uh, we're curious to hear that uh, you've been discussing uh, uh, at least very, very well discussions that I heard in, in, the, in the meeting rooms I joined. But let's start with group number one. Uh, what's the one or two takeaways that you want to share? Yo, you were there in that group. Oh, Martin, don't know who's the spokesperson. Uh, Joe, you're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute is like the number, the word yeah. most used last year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the buzzword. Okay. All right. So um, uh, we had a great dialogue. We had, the, uh, you know, we actually had the pleasure of having, uh, you know, Marvin in the room, uh, who had just gotten done giving us a great overview of Singapore Airlines. Uh, so it was appropriate and um, at healthcare represented and uh, what we came up with, and I always, I always like to list the bullet points or the ideas that drove us to our final uh, selection of one theme that's important when it comes to implementation. And it's something that I think all of these comments are shared uh, by experience of the individuals that were in our team one. First is it's all about the user experience. Implementation, 
And, and it's interesting because user requirements show up all the way through strategy building and strategy execution and implementation. So it's all about the user experience and how it's going to have an impact on the user. Um, I think Martin made a great statement when he said we have to make an implementation. We have making the messy bit implementation less messy, and that's going to take some uh, advanced tools, techniques, and uh, processes. Uh, and we had Antonio, the godfather of project management. I mean, I loved his comment when he said the PMO and SMO of today is not going to be what the PMO SMO has to be in tomorrow. So there has to be some new uh, con concepts put in play. Uh, the second is um, people want fast decisions. Gone are the days of paper reports. Gone are the days of, oh, wait a day, I'll get it for you. They want it now. And the other, per uh, other thoughts were making sure that we have agility and resilience built in to this, what appears to be the evolution of uh, ecosystems and how all the parts of the organization connect. And what about the stakeholders and stakeholders, customers, stakeholders, boards, uh, the populations of countries, et cetera, et cetera. So we came down to tying all those together. It's we're going to have to pour more resources of people and costs and machines and technology together uh, into play because that's what's going to drive things going forward. And um, any comment from other team one members? Did I leave anything out? You felt that the AI route was going to join some of this together? Yes, exactly. Uh, I talked about my early experiences in IBM back in the late 80s and early 90s when IBM had AI and shelved it because they couldn't make any money. And now that I look back to where we are now, it was these two, two driving curves, one of hardware, one of software, have now joined over the last three, four years. And that's why you have all of, all of these AI capabilities and it basically gets us to the point of saying, if you can think it, you can pr probably get it done with any technology that's out there. And, but we have to have more of it for the strategy implementation side. That was group one. Thank You're you, Joel. Thank you. Okay. For uh, Martin in the group, let's go to group two. I think uh, who was there? Antonio, there was no one there. That's why I moved to group, group three. Group correct. One. There was nobody in group two. Group three. Hey guys, my name is Carol, um, sure. representing group three. Um, so in our discussion, um, everyone shared their ideas and the common theme. And I think the central focus um, was about um, people and communication. And one thing that stood out to us is that the importance for there be, to be um, for there to be a culture where everyone is ready to to adapt and to be kind of resilient to hard times and change. and see science and how people interact, how people stay engaged, how people will feel connected in order to, to kind of still be able to contribute to changes and how quickly they'll be able to adapt to changes. One thing that we um, came to an understanding of is that um, using a, a structure, restructuring transformation um, to adapt digitalization to allow communication across the board to be um, sped up. So uh, one thing that I believe Richard mentioned was um, the ability to respond quickly to change. And so um, our focus was on creating a culture of resilience to, um, to and this is because in previous times, things like 50 years ago, an industry would take a longer period of time for there to be a development and change, but we're in a world that is current, constantly changing. So then it has to be a system in stage where information about where the industry is going is coming in. And then using that information with um, sustaining the long-term goals 
focusing on the um, the twenty percent within the industry that's going to create eighty percent of the results. So, thank that's you. What we were talking about. Thank you, Carol. And I love what this group did, which is Carol wanted to develop a bit of experience and, and they appointed Carol to be the spokesperson. So I think this is all about the community to give opportunities to develop on whatever we can. So well done group there, well done, Carol. Uh, group four, Abdullah, Ahmed, Luis, Michele, who's your spokesperson? Ahmed is our uh, spokesperson, Mr. Ahmed. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, actually, we uh, we discussed the uh, need of a body of knowledge for the strategy implementation. Uh, I think Antonio and Robin, they led already the base for that in, in, in the strategy institute with these uh, seven modules and four phases. But we need to have a real body of knowledge and uh, take into account two things uh, my colleagues mentioned. One of them to take the impact of disruption on uh, uh, disruption on disruptive technologies, the age we are uh, living in now, on the strategy implementation, and also to take into consideration to have as much as we can real uh, case studies so that the people learn about strategy implementation. Uh, then we spoke also about how to how we raise the interest in the uh, strategy implementation uh, professionals in the organizations so that it becomes maybe later on like uh, a career a part of the fauna of the uh, uh, organization uh, people that we have so and uh, so that we make strategy implementation professionals like an indispensable for the organization part of the organization uh, because as louis mench mentioned uh, project managers maybe they don't have all the uh, necessary uh, capabilities qualifications and experience in strategy implementation so strategy implementation is not like any other project so this is why we spoke about this item, eh? the need for specific body of knowledge to create it maybe by volunteering uh, in the near future by the Institute. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, group five, group four, sorry. A group five now, Aisha, Alan, Emma, Mohamed, Shirley, who's your spokesperson? That's, that's to be me. Okay, Alan. Hi, everybody. So yeah, my, my team, uh, we're Emma, Ricky, uh, Aicho, Shirley, and myself. So at this point in time, we're going to start to regurgitate what the previous groups had said. So I let me start by saying that uh, we started talking about lots of AI and in going with the in industry trends for that sort of uh, real-time processing and intelligence uh, knowing that businesses will be um, driven from a digital point of view. But then we started to focus more on the people side of change and sort of conversing about the ability to respond to change, not just agility, but the people need to be open to change. And we threw in some uh, metaphors saying, if you can't change the people, then change the people. And Robin jumped in saying, well, management needs to change too, or change the management. So on the people side of things, driven from comments from the uh, presenters, and we then focus on the more culture issues because of the virtual um, interactions that are becoming more and more commonplace, and it's becoming a norm. And norms impact your culture and helps to form or even change change your culture. So the virtual um, culture is is there, and how we see this. Um, happening in the future, it's sort of not, not very straightforward, but it's, it certainly is an issue. And just saying that now, I'm thinking that maybe there has to be people qualified to manage culture change, just as you have people qualified to manage projects and strategy and so on, maybe a culture change certification or something might be um, worth considering. And <clears throat> finally, I think um, the traditional tools may not be as effective as they once were. So Porters and some of the other tools that people are more familiar with, maybe some new way of new ways of thinking in terms of your strategy formulation, which would then um, help get better 
results when you start to implement your strategy. So I don't know if any of my other group uh, members would want to jump in and say anything that more. Um, if not, well, then that's it for us. Thank you, Samo. And last group, but no least, Jap, Randall, Ricardo, Leo, and Tom. Another amazing group here. Thank you. Uh, this is Tom uh, trying to summarize uh, the, dis the good discussion that we had. Um, so I think what we said is, what is the future of strategy implementation and also the uh, future of the Institute? I think let's clearly set the goal. The goal is to reduce the strategy realization failure rate. You know, if we don't have an impact on uh, whether strategy is being implemented better, um, then why are we here? We need to have an impact on it. Secondly, that proving that strategy implementation professionals, and that can be in a strategy uh, management office, or it can be any professional in an organization, because everybody is a strategy implementation professional, can unlock new value. Um, and it's not about you know having uh, a project management office being effective. It is about everybody in the organization learning new skills so that strategy is implemented better. So we need to do it in a new way. And for the Institute, of course, the challenge is to stay competitive uh, versus other uh, qualifications that are out there. Um, thirdly, that we uh, partner with others in the wider ecosystem, whether it's a digital ecosystem um, or whether it's public-private partnerships. Uh, but uh, you know, nowadays we have to partner broadly in order to be successful. And fourthly, um, and lastly, it is uh, ultimately it's about being a leader yourself. So making a personal commitment uh, and making a personal difference uh, to the implementation of the strategy is going to be critical. Um, so it's not due to the PMOs or the project management professionals. No, everybody else, everybody in our organization um, needs to make a, a commitment and a difference to realize the strategy. And I think the challenge for us is, uh, amongst others, how can we involve more people and increase the skills of more people to be able to, uh, to, be able to do this better? Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Tom. Um, so I don't know. I'll, from my side, I, I'll pass it then to Ricky and Robin. But uh, I want to thank you uh, for being with us these three days, uh, the beginning of a, a new era. Um, and and uh, if you're questioning what's next, so we're on the short term, immediately, we are going to be working on the white paper. And for that, we will ask you to fill in a survey so that we capture a much structured uh, in input and examples. So that, that lead to the white paper. So we still need to work on that. But over the next days or week, we'll send you that to, to fill in and get your input based also on what you learn in this conference. So this is what we wanted to do. So that's the immediate next step. The second big step, and I think this is new. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> it's something that we have behind, but last year was really ramping up and building those partnerships and getting people like you on board. You are the, the first ones. I, I always remember in PMI how important are the first hundred and the first thousand people after years, then we look at them with a lot of respect. And you are those people here in the Strategy Implementation Institute. In a few years, people will look at you and say, wow, you were part of those 100 or 200 or 1,000. So that's our, our ambition. But the membership meetings, this is something that is part of what we want to bring to you. It's an essential part. This is building and continued with the network that we started these days. So we'll have monthly meetings. Uh, we'll adjust the timing so one day will be more European, US friendly, other times more Singapore Asian friendly, uh, so that everybody can join. Will be recorded so we can you can always have a look later on, and we'll discuss topics like these three days, trends, uh, networking, uh, your experience with the course, how can we do it, and and I think as soon as we can volunteering. Uh, opportunities, partnering opportunities too. So it's going to be something that we want you 
to be part on the decision making as well. It's, it's how do you want this network to be? Uh, so the first session will probably be around what you're expecting, what you'd like to see from this network, what can you contribute? So that's something that we will co-create as well. Uh, we love this co-creation. I think that's the power, that's the beauty now that we can do this together. Uh, so you'll hear from us very soon on, on both things, on the on, on the uh, white paper, on the monthly members meeting. And of course, highly recommend if you've not done the course, um, of course, we encourage you to subscribe to the course. I think the learning experience uh, it's, 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 it's something that we hear all the time, how precious has been for people who have a lot of certifications or experience. And if you can help us spread the word, I think it's a, we need your voice to get to those people who make decisions on learning, on education, on what's next for the people. So we really would appreciate that uh, extra support on spreading the word so that this becomes the new standard. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Robin and, and if Rick. I can, if I can echo Antonio what you just said, the, the feedback from you is because Antonio and I spent almost three years developing the course when we launched it last January. So to hear your feedback and comments has just been wonderful. And I'll just add on a couple of things to what Antonio has mentioned, excuse me. Uh, you mentioned uh, the body of knowledge and just to give you an update, it's now in version 2.0, which is being professionally edited. We did choose at the end of last year to rush it out because many of you were just about to do the exam. So we wanted to give it to you. Um, we did debate internally whether to wait till we'd finished the editing, but we knew it would take a couple more months. So it continues to be improved. It is a living document. As you see it, you're getting it um, you know, in the next few weeks. We look forward to also to people who want to volunteer and contribute articles to keep the document and update it which will also, of course, impact the course. And as Antonio mentioned, your opinion matters. So post-conference, uh, we'll ask you not only on your inputs for the white paper, but also for your feedback, because we want to make this possibly a semi or annual event with more opportunities. And um, you know, Antonio already mentioned that we'll alter the, the, the timing, but the day will always be the first Tuesday of the month. So I think it's like March the 2nd, if I remember correctly. Um, and then Antonio and I will host uh, alternatively so we can cover everybody on timing. Uh, before I hand over to Ricky to do the closing, I would like to say my own personal thank you. Uh, first of all, to our MC Ricky, who's done a wonderful job. So we can give her a virtual round of applause. Uh, she's been fantastic. Um, I'd like to thank my partner, Antonio. Um, who's you know, put up with me as we put this conference together. So thank you to Antonio for that. And I'd like to thank all of you because you know, to see some of you like you know, Tom, I'm looking at this screen now, you were one of our very first on board. Um, you know, and Martin, who's been helping us promote the UK and Randy, you know, been working with in the US. And there's so many of you, I won't have time to go through everyone, but you've all been wonderful building what Antonio and I set out to do which is have the community of strategy implementers and to share the passion with other like people. So thank you to all of you for helping make what Antonio and I was actually a, a lunch discussion during an execution conference in Riyadh in the Saudi Kingdom when we came up with the thought of let's bringing the community together and to have our first inaugural conference launched Thank you to for all of you for making that vision come alive. Ricky. Wow, it's uh, very, it's filling. It fills you up with joy. And I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. You know, do you, do you feel more inspired about the future of strategy implementation now than when you did on day one? You know, I'm, I'm sure you're nodding there. Have you ever yes. got to the end of a conference and wished there was more and think, what else is there? I want to continue. Uh, I, I got a sense that that's happening as well. And then now are you prepared to step up, step up and create systematic changes that are people focused and technolo technically enabled? And I would reckon you are. 
if you've answered yes to those questions, then you can be really proud of what you've learned and contributed to over the last three days and know that you're among friends. And if you said no, you probably weren't really here and just Zoom bombed in the last 15 minutes or so and that's what's happened. But seriously, though, it's been a delight getting to know you, hearing from you, understanding your passion and commitment to strategy implementation. And I really look forward to supporting you and your businesses again. Robin and Antonio, thank you for entrusting me with your people. Thank you, thank you for entrusting me to um, make sure that we start and finish on time and everybody um, is supported in the right way. It's a real privilege for me and I look forward to supporting the, the Institute going forward. Um, to, to you in um, virtual land, I hope we get a chance to meet one day. You have been fabulous. And if I can support you in your businesses and in any way, reach out to me on LinkedIn or ricky at rickynovak.com. I look forward to hearing about your continued successes. And I would love a copy of that white paper, Robert and Antonio. That's got to come my way. <laughs> so good night, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good, good afternoon. Night. Everyone. Good and night. Look forward to continued success. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you very much. thank you. Thank you for this yeah. opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody.